Right. Um, well, welcome to the pollinators class. Um, please help me welcome Bob Gillespie. Uh, Bob's been an entomologist for over 42 years. And before retirement, he spent 20 years as faculty member at the Wenatchee Valley College. Uh, during that time, he taught courses in organic and sustainable agriculture, entomology, natural resources, biology, and outdoor recreation. And in his final 11 years at WVC, the Ag and Natural Resources students conducted surveys of the native bees and other pollinators associated with native plants bordering cherry and apple orchards to determine if any entered the orchard to supplement pollination by honeybees. So, uh, Bob, take it away. Thanks. Probably hold your applause and talk. <laughs> no, I want to welcome you to the introduction of pollinator diversity. And I'm you're well happy to ask me questions if you like during the presentation. I'm happy to uh, answer those. Um, you won't ruin my chain, chain of thought because I don't have one, so <laughs> you'll be fine. So I also know that I am uh, talking to the choir, basically. I know all of you are very, very interested in environmental issues and ecological issues. And so what I, in retirement, what I would like to do is be able to help you get the word out. And so what I did is I brought my, part of my insect collection, which is on the first table here. And after the talk, we're welcome to take a look at that and see what you think of it. And also some of the books that I utilize for information about pollinators. So hopefully this is a little bit of my library and a little bit of my collection of books that I'm looking at. And also I wanted to let you know that my ensemble today is a bald face hornet. <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing I wanted to mention too is August 13th, we're doing a pollinator diversity workshop in Mount Vernon. And it's sponsored by the North Cascade Institute and WSU Northwest Research and Extension Center. So if you were interested in pollinators, you're welcome to come to that session and I'd be happy to, to introduce you in greater detail to the diversity of pollinators in this area. <laughs> All right, here we go. Didn't advance. Oh, I did it the wrong way. Okay. <laughs> A little tech challenged. Okay, there we go. Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to introduce you to pollinator diversity and I want to use the different orders of insects to do that. So the first order, my favorite, are the hymenoptera, which are the bees, wasps, ants, and sawflies. Oops. There we go. Okay, so this order of insects include predators, parasitoids, pollinators, and I give them another P, pretty. So the four P's are high enough. So some of them are very, very beautiful. And you can see here, well, not as well as you might like, but this is a metallic uh, sweat bee. And the other one is a, uh, one of the uh, Ichneumonids, and it's probing that log to find the larvae that's feeding in that log so it can lay its egg on that. Uh, Cat, uh, either the caterpillar or the beetle that's in that log. And then the uh, egg will hatch and the larvae will develop on, uh, on that insect. And the other thing I wanna to mention too is a lot of people have a lot of fear of uh, this particular order because they can, many of them can sting. And so people don't like to be stung by these insects. And so I'm hoping to give you an idea of what individuals you might want to avoid and other individuals that really, even if you got stung, it's just going to feel like a pin trick. It's very, very painless. So. Okay, so the hymenopter, how do they get their name? There are the married wings. And the reason they're called married wings is because they have these little tiny hooks on their hind wing that hook up into a channel on their front wing so they can unite the wings when they fly and they have larger surface area to fly. But the nice thing about that, when they're um, wandering around in a flower or they're searching for a prey, they can unhook those wings and fold them over their back so they're not banging around in the environment to, to cause problems for them and, and uh, minimize or impact their travels. 
Okay, the sawflies are the first group. The sawflies are an interesting group in the sense that they are uh, pollinators, not as uh, as adept at as, as the uh, bees are, but still, they the difference between them and the other hymenoptera are the fact that if you look at the very very top, you can see that the sawflies abdomen is broadly attached to the thorax, and um, they don't have a waist like the uh, wasps and bees and ants have. And the other thing that they don't have is their uh, ovipositor or egg laying device hasn't been modified into a stinger. So they really can't sting. They can look like it, they could cause a lot of pain, but they actually can't do that. And this is one that scares people in the woods because this soft light a uh, little cirrus that occurs after uh, fires. This is this uh, egg laying device, an ovipositor. And so it's able to probe the wood and then lay its eggs underneath the bark or inside of the tree or the stump in order for the eggs to develop inside of their of log. And many of them too are external feeders. This one is not, but they look like caterpillars. And the difference between them and the butterfly and moth caterpillars is they have more prolates than the butterflies and moths. And the uh, butterflies and moths have little tiny hooks on their uh, prolates so they can attach themselves to a, a stem. And so if any wind comes along or anything like that, they can maintain themselves on that branch. So they get, don't get blown off to the ground and they have to crawl all the way back up to get their food. So. So those, and like I said, you're welcome to ask me questions if you have any. Okay, distinguishing wasps from bees. So um, wasps are generally uh, very hairless and um, they also utilize animal for their prey to feed their young. So they, they depend on insects and spiders for uh, their food where bees have changed their diet to some extent in the sense that they use pollen and nectar both as an adult and they also use pollen and nectar to feed their young. And the other thing about <clears throat> the wasp are they, they're relatively hairless and their hairs are uh, just a single branch. And I'll show you the hairs of a, of a, uh, a bee. They, they look like little tiny Christmas trees under the microscope. And the first group are the parasitic wasps. And these are uh, very, very interesting insects. Again, their ovipositor or egg laying device has not been modified into a stinger. <clears throat> so they can only use it to lay eggs. And the other thing is they are parasitoids, which means the adults are free living but the larvae feed on some insect for their prey. And so they attack caterpillars, beetles, flies, aphids, scales, mealybugs, and white flies. And as you help people develop habitat for um, various wildlife for bees and stuff like that, you're also going to see some of these little wasps show up in, in that particular habitat. And so the first one you can see is it's an egg laying device there, and it's probing to find a prey. And then, do any of you like aphids? <laughs> so this little parasitic wasp is an amazing little parasitic wasp. And look how acrobatic it is. It can actually curl its abdomen around underneath its legs and then it's probing and laying its egg inside of that aphid. And then the egg hatch and the larvae develops. And then unfortunately you can't see it here, but if you see what looks like tan baseball on the leaf with two little uh, tailpipes, that's a parasitized aphid. And then what will happen is the, the larvae will uh, pupate and then the adult will cut a nice round hole out of the aphid and pop out of them and then you're looking for more aphids to lay aphids. So they're very, very important uh, insects and underappreciated. And I have some in my collection so you can see how tiny they are actually. Okay, solitary wasps. So this is a group of wasps. I know people don't like wasps because when they think of wasps, they think of yellow jackets 
and bald face hornets. And so they are very aggressive at the state. But if you're a solitary wasp, you're the only one around to actually lay eggs and provide food for your young. And so if you go out to sting somebody, which is dangerous, you're likely, likely to get killed. And so they're more reticent about stinging than if you're a social wasp where you've got all of these workers. You lose a couple of workers, big deal. You got a lot more to do the work. So, so not too much is lost, but you can see here, here's one of them that's actually used its uh, ovipositor that's now been uh, modified into a stinger. It stings its prey, so it's immobile, but it's alive. And then it can either fly it to its nest in the soil, or it can actually walk it to the nest to feed its young. And then there's uh, a group of wasps called spider wasps. I don't know if any of you have watched them face off with each other. There's a, a large one called a tarantula hawk that actually attacks the tarantulas and they'll face off and do this dance. So that the uh, a wasp can get around to the back of the other spider and then uh, and sting it and then immobilize it and then lay its egg on the spider. And then this egg catches it and the larvae feeds inside of the live spider. So, and it's a, a whole family of spider wasps. And this one here is called a velvet ant. This is another wasp, a female gorillas. And sometimes they're called a caterpillar. Can you see the stinger right there? So that one can cause some pain. So if you have children out there and they're playing with ants and they happen to be hairy like that, <laughs> get them away from there because that's going to be a painful sting if they get stung by that particular individual. And then the social wasps. So these are the ones that most people dislike the most. So the reason they're such a problem, like I was saying, is that they're, they have a caste system. They have, of course, the queen, the workers, and, and the males or the drones. And so they only the female overwinters, and so she has to start a new colony every season. So a lot of times you'll see very, very few yellow jackets around early in the season. But as the season develops, there'll be more and more of those. They've collected food and some of these. Uh, new generations that come out to be and work for the for the high. Um, so again, the insect prey. Uh, the interesting thing is they have what's called an aggregation pheromone, so they can actually send out a chemical if they think their nest is being uh, traumatized, and then they'll send out a bunch of workers and they'll come out to protect it. And they can sting multiple times. They're not like a honeybee where they pull out their stinger and it's all over for them and they die. And they can also bite. So, so, so they can be very highly aggressive. So the, the most important thing, if you're out in the field, you need to be the fastest person away from the house. <laughs> the slowest person is going to be in trouble. So. Yeah, and so these are the social wasps. I know all of you have seen probably some of these hanging in a branch. They can uh, live in the ground. Some of them live in the ground, and some of them can even get into wall boys and be in people's houses and stuff like that. Uh, I had a, well, my sister and sister in law and brother in law, they have an infestation of yellow jackets in their house. And they were concerned because oftentimes what will happen is people will uh, seal up their exit hole and then they'll spray them. But then they chew through the wall board and they come into the house. So that's not, that's not a good method of control. But what I told my, the, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law is to use it as a trap house. So you burn your house and then you build a new house. <laughs> They didn't take my recommendation serious. Can you believe it? You didn't appeal to their emotions. No, I, I know it, Rachel. I didn't listen well enough, did I? Okay, so the bees. So this is the big distinguishing characteristic between them and the wasps. One is their food source. Two is they modify their bodies in order to, well, through evolution, they haven't actually modified their bodies, but their bodies are modified. To have a flat structure called a uh, pollen basket or orbicula, and there's going to be a quiz. So, um, 
And then they also have these uh, a brush of hairs that's called scopa. And so between the uh, pollen basket and the hairs, they're able to, uh, to collect pollen very, very effectively. And then the bees and the plant tend to be a different charge. So they're electrostatically attracted, the pollen is to the insects. So, so there's all these different uh, activities that are going on to help the bee collect pollen efficiently. And then here's the hair that I was trying to show you. See how they look like little tiny Christmas trees? So there are a lot of bees, well, not a lot, but there's a few bees that aren't very hairy. And so it's very difficult to tell whether they're a bee or a wasp. And, and so for me, sometimes I, I get stuck. And so if I can put them under the scope and find those hairs, and I know that's a bee, if it's a straight bristle, then it's a, a wasp. And they're solitary bees. So these are like the solitary wasps. They got to do all the work themselves. They, the female goes out, uh, collects pollen and nectar, uh, sequesters it, stores it in its nest, and then lays an egg and the egg develops and the larvae develops, the egg hatches and the larvae develops on, on that particular uh, mass of pollen and nectar. And we have five uh, main families of solitary bees and we have four of which are common in the Northwest. And I just want to go through those four common families just to give you an idea of the diversity of, of the uh, bees. Oh, and this is a picture of a solitary bee. So 70% of the solitary bees uh, nest in the soil. And this happens to be a little sweat bee. You can see she's coming out of her nest and then there, you can't really see this here, but here's a young Kenya, another one that's getting ready to emerge as well. So. So they'll live in a, like a solitary nest or they'll live in aggregations. So it'll be like a, a townhouses where you have all these different openings where they're at, or they can live more like a, a, an apartment where you have one entry and then they have all of these little apartments associated with it. So the first group are the mining bees, the Andrinas. And they're a large family. And the way we tell them apart from the other bees is if you look up here, they have two subactyl sutures right below the antennae. And then when you look at the basal vein, it's this main vein right here, it's very, very straight. And then they have three submarginal cells, which are up there. So everybody will remember that, right? <laughs> I knew it. I knew I could count on you. Yeah, so this is the problem with them. They're small, and the characteristics often, it takes time in a microscope to be able to see them. So, but but what I'm hoping is that uh, people will get kind of a, uh, a gestalt kind of vision of what the uh, bee looks like, you know, so they can kind of put them into groups. I think that's as good as we can do in a lot of instances. And I think that's enough to um, help people understand how diverse bees are. And these, uh, like their name is mining because they live in the soil. So their nests are found in the soil. The next group are the uh, yellow-faced and plaster bees. Oftentimes we call the yellow-faced the clown bees because they have this nice white face like a clown has. So they tend to be uh, uh, not as many species as the adrenas, but here's the clown-faced bee. And they're very, very tiny. And I have some examples in my collection if you want to take a look. And then there's the uh, plaster bees, which are more like the size of the antrenates. They're maybe about half the size of a, a honeybee. And the, so they have only one subantennal suture where the antrenates have two. So we look for that. And then they have, in the case of the Kalinids, they have three submarginal cells. And they have this interesting face that's kind of heart shaped because the uh, eyes tend to converge at the lower part of their face. So they kind of look like a heart. And also they have this vein here is the second recurrent vein is, is S shaped. So we have to look at that to be sure if we're looking at a Kalinid or not. And the next group are the halictids or the sweat bees. 
And does anybody know why they're called sweat bees? Yeah, it's exactly right. That's how they got the name, and that really freaks people out because they'll come along, you know, sit on their arm, you know, and they're all they're really looking for is a little bit of moisture and some minerals and stuff like that. And so uh, people uh, tend to swat them, and I try to, no, 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 no. So, so they have one sub sub suture, and their basal vein is uh, J shaped, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. And these also nest. Oh, that's the other interesting thing. They also nest in the ground, and they're able to produce a chemical that creates like uh, cellophane. And so it will actually uh, they'll coat the nest with this cellophane, so that they're very very resistant to to water and flooding and things of that nature. So, and that's where they got the name plaster bees. Yeah. So here's that J shape on the front wing. And then there's the beautiful uh, metallic green sweat beads that everybody probably is familiar with. They are really very, very attractive. So, And then there's the uh, solitary bees, the megakinids, and they're called long chum. So they can, uh, they can uh, exploit different flowers than all the ones before this are called short chum. So they're usually on some kind of an open flower like a dandelion or some kind of an aspen, they're much more efficient at picking up pollen and nectar from them. But with long, long tongue bees, now they can get down into a flower like a pinstamen. If you've ever seen bees in a pinstamen, all you see is their rear end. They're down there getting pollen and nectar from, uh, from the plant. And they tend to be uh, moderately sized and stout body, where the other ones are, are not nearly as stout bodied as the mega pilots are. The mason bees you're probably familiar with, they are uh, used, they're above ground nesters. Remember, 30% of them uh, nest above ground as far as the total number of bees that are out there. And so they usually use existing cavities, but we can also provide them with uh, nesting blocks and nesting houses for, for mason bees. The other thing that's interesting about these, I told you that they, every bee collects pollen on their legs. They have this um, basket and these scopa hairs. Well, they collect theirs on the underside of their abdomen. So their pollen collection is in that area rather than that. And here's a, a good example of a leaf cutter bee, which is in the same family. Look at all the pollen on the underside of that abdomen. So it's just amazing. And when they're flying around, I call them butts up. So their abdomen will be <laughs> elevated like this and they're moving around, picking up pollen. And then uh, a lot of people do not like these bees especially if you like roses, because they'll come along and they'll cut out nice notches out of the roses, and then they use that to line their cells. So people really don't like that. I think it's very attractive, but you know, I might be biased. <laughs> and then the other thing I wanted to tell you too is that the mason bees are called mason because instead of using plant material, they use uh, mud. And so they'll mix it with their saliva and then they'll not line their nests in that fashion with that. And the, the mason bees are very, very good pollinators, especially for like fruit trees early because they're out early and out earlier than most of our native bees. And they're out about the same time as bumblebees. So between bumblebees and these mason bees, they can be very incredible, very, very good pollinators for like blueberries and cherries and things of that nature. So, and they're, we're using them now as pollinators in, in some of the uh, orchards. How about I have a question? Yeah. Solitary bees are managed. Yes. Okay. That's, yes, that's really true. Yeah. Are those, those are the only three that are essentially managed? No, well, I'm going to say unfortunately not. No, because people are starting to use bumblebees in greenhouses and also in some of our food crops. And it sounds like a good idea on the surface because Bumblebees are more efficient at pollinating these plants than a honeybee is. They're out, they're out earlier, they're in worse weather conditions. They're actually can buzz pollinate, so they're even more efficient pollinators. But the unfortunate thing about this is that they're releasing uh, these bumblebees, and sometimes they're not even a species that exists in the area. And so if they have any diseases or anything, 
then they're passing those diseases around. So you have this in the in the parasympathetic colony collapse that you get with the non-solid therapies. Do they still get the solid therapies still obtain some of the symptoms? Yeah, they're not exactly the same, but they're very similar. Like there's one uh, nosema that attacks bumblebees. Uh, there's nosema lacus, nosema cerese that attacks the honeybees. There's a uh, nosema bombus that attacks bumblebees. So, so yeah, there's a real concern about that. The disease getting out, uh, we're very, very concerned. There's a bumblebee called the Franklin bumblebee that was had very, very narrow distribution. We can't find it. So we think it went extinct. And so there's real concern about this same thing happening here. Some groups now are using these at least that are uh, native to the area. But again, I really worry about this. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. All right. Um, well, it's kind of looking at, I know, um, like some work being done by Paul Stamets, looking at some of the noise data in isolation to help like combat some of the quality collapse. Is that research still being put forward? He, yes, he's still using that, yeah, especially for honeybees. And I haven't heard anything about bumblebees or anything like that, but, but I think there's some real possibilities there. So. Yeah, so with the bumblebees, what we're concerned about is that you release these. So the plant, the orchard plant is going to be, the fruit's going to be in bloom for maybe two weeks. And then where are these bumblebees going to go? They're going to start competing with bumblebees that are already ex exist in the area. So I think it would be a better method to create habitat for the bumblebees that already exist here, then they will move into the crop, pollinate, and then they can move out of that and then spend their time on the native plants that they need throughout the rest of their season to provide pollen and nectar for that population, so. And the last group of Hymenoptera are the social bees. And of course, we're really familiar with honeybees and bumblebees. So, and unfortunately, honeybees are not native to, the, to, the, to North America. They were introduced by the colonists in the 1600s. So, in laws just have a mixed feelings about honeybees. But I try not to express it too much. <laughs> you know, like Rachel was talking about. Too. Tone it down, down, tamp it down, tamp it down. So, but you get, but they have, they are easily easy to manage. So they and they do contribute tremendously to our economy. So it's kind of a mixed bag. And you were talking, asking about colony collapse disorder. This is one of the things that are a, really an issue. And I, I actually have a talk on colony collapse disorder. But if somebody was interested in, in hearing about that, I would be happy to go into that to uh, that topic. And then the bumblebees are the other social bees. And, and the bumblebees, again, are social um, in the sense like the uh, bald face hornets and the yellow jackets, is that they develop an annual colony and then they produce males in the, in the late summer or early fall. And then they mate with new queens and then the queens have to find a place to overwinter. And so this is where, when you guys are talking about habitat, this is important as well, is for them to have overwintering habitat. So like when people are cleaning up their yards and stuff like that, if they could wait till spring after the bumblebees emerge, oftentimes they'll utilize cavities and debris and stuff like that to overwinter it. And then they'll, be, they'll come out in the springtime to, to uh, begin the colony all over again. And then the male dies. And I don't know if you know this about insects, but they don't have a lot of use for males. <laughs> if you don't produce, you're out of there. Same way with honeybees and the bumblebees. They just don't, they don't deal with them. Yeah, I guess I, I kind of got ahead of myself. <laughs> anyway, so this is what's going on with the honeybees. So the fact that they have, uh, overwinter in colonies, and this is why they produce the honey. It's, I mean, we'd like to think they're doing it for us so that we have something to put on our cereal and on our toast and stuff like that. But actually, they're trying to produce food for themselves so they can overwinter. And so this, this gives you a good idea of what the pollen basket looks like in the hairs on this particular honeybee. And honeybees sometimes are a little difficult to identify because they can come in little different shades of color, but they have hairy eyes. They'll have like hairs coming out of their eyes. And 
there's not very many other bees that have that. And then also you can see how effective they are packing that all that on their legs to return to the, to the nest. And another thing I know people are concerned about is uh, the giant Asian hornet and honeybees. So I have an example of that if you want to take a look at it a little bit later. So you can see how big it is. Yeah, yeah Richard. What, what is the hair on the eyes? What, what is that about? <laughs> <laughs> just Rich, I'm going to give you a, a swag. Okay. It's a scientific wild ass guess. Okay. <laughs> what do we think it's for? Uh, it's a, for sensory, I think. Okay. Yeah. But they're using it for that, but yeah. But that's a swag. <laughs> and then uh, bumblebees. And then my son, was, <laughs> my son was in the Transformers, <laughs> so I had to do this. So. And there's actually 46 species of bumblebees in the United States, and we have 25 bumblebees in Washington. So there are quite a few different species. They're, they're really beautiful. Um, I'd like, and we have some wonderful guides for identifying, but they don't stay still. They keep moving. So in order to see their characteristics, it can be a real challenge. If you're a real good photographer, I think that's one way to try to identify them. But there's some variation also in their, their coloration and their hairs because uh, you guys all heard of uh, Batesian mimicry. So if you can cause pain, like bumblebees can if they sting, if you all kind of look alike, then, every, then a bird or anything else is gonna come and prey on you. It's a kind of a search image of this and they go, oh, that's not a good thing to tackle. With, so I'm just gonna avoid all of them. So, so that's part of the issue with the, the bumblebees. And most of them nest in the ground, uh, usually in a mouse hole, some of them in a bird nest, but there's so many other areas you might find them, you know, like if you have a, a pile of uh, wood, they might be underneath the wood if there's a cavity there. Uh, a tussock, large tussocks of grass, I've seen uh, a bumblebee's nest in that particular situation. The only thing is that they, they're really good at hiding their nest. I've spent hours looking for their nest. And when I was first started this study, like Emma was saying, I found a nest of them. I thought, well, how hard can this be? I've never found another nest. They're amazing. <laughs> I've tried to follow them back to the nest and everything, and I failed every time. It's, they're amazing at how good they are at hiding. Yeah, so then the, the queen's going to stay in the nest. You know, once the first brood is raised and their workers are out, then she stays in the nest, and then the brood does all of the work. Uh, collecting and taking care of the, the young. And the colonies can get to be maybe 50 to 250 workers, and that's about as large as they get. So it's not like honeybees where you can have thousands and thousands of, of workers in a hive. And so this is what co concerns me, and I think concerns, oops, sorry, concerns a lot of people is that our bumblebees, they need, they need pollen and nectar throughout the season. So we, they need native plants or plants, but I'm pushing native plants for the extended period of time. And, this, and then they'll be able to develop and, and, and enlarge their colonies to the point that it's possible, to the extent possible during that particular growing season. So, so that, that's, I think, very, very important when it comes to, to bumblebees. And the nice thing about bumblebees too is they, they're gonna be around throughout the whole season. So if you plant something that's good for bumblebees, it's gonna be good for a lot of other bees and a lot of other, uh, birds and other wildlife. So I, I know I'm using pollinators as my stick, but really those habitats are gonna be good for much more than just pollinators. Oops, too fast. Nope, okay. So I'm gonna, how much time do I, I think I'm still okay. So I'm gonna talk about some other pollinators that oftentimes you think of bees. And, and I forgot to mention too, wasps are actually good pollinators as well. So they actually, the adults will go to the flower and pick up pollen and nectar because they need a ready source of energy. They're gonna go out and hunt for prey. So you'll find them on the flowers as well. So the other group I'm gonna talk, talk about are flies, beetles, and I'm just going to mention butterflies and wasps because I need to run out of time. 
And even, and even thrips. People aren't crazy about thrips. Have you had to deal with thrips? Yes. Yeah, okay. They're fine then. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, geez. Okay, here's a one that I want to show you. So Don Rolfs is a very, very uh, interesting individual. He's a retired orthodontist, but after he retired, he got very, very interested in insects. And so he, and he's a great photographer. So he took a picture of this. So at the top is our smallest bee, and then here is our largest bumblebee. And we have over 650 species of bees in Washington and, and counted. So there's a lot there to preserve. Here's a, a, a honeybee right there, but you can see how the size vary from the very small to the very large. And a lot of them are tiny, and, and I we call them uh, black or brown uh, uh, small bees, bee smalls. <laughs> anyway, I like them because uh, I forgot to mention that the some of these, like the mason bee, the blue orchard bee, the acronym is Bob. And so I like that. That's one of the things. Okay, so before I go into the flies, I just want to show you some of the resources that are available for uh, beginning to appreciate bees. And I have them over here on the table too, if you want to look at them after we get down, but I know what many of you want to go to a meal, right, and eat. So I think that could be a high priority. Oh, and two uh, very, very good websites for this kind of information is the Xerxes Society and Pollinator Partnership. So those are really good, good ones. And there's a lot more out there. I mean, there's a lot of the native plant societies are doing work as well. Conservation districts, NRCS. I mean, there's site after site after site. But those are two that, I, those are my go-to to begin with. And then I start looking at other sites for, for information. Okay, the, the flies. And so why are they called diptera? Diptera means two wings and flies have one, uh, front wing, major front wing that they use for flight, and then they modify their hind wings into this little structure here called a halter. It's a stabilizer. And so if uh, their front wing goes up, the stabilizer goes down. And so it helps to keep them flying straight, kind of like an octet with a plane. And I hate to admit this, but there are entomologists that have clipped those and then let the fly take off and they just dive to the ground. Bad situation. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of you will recognize this fly. They're really attractive. And they're yellow and brown or black. So they want to look kind of like a honeybee or a bee uh, because they don't they can't stay. So that's a problem for them. So they want to look like something that can cause harm. And then the other cool thing about a lot of the surfaces are in the larval stage, you mentioned that you didn't like aphids. The, what the serpent fly or hover fly will do a lay and say in the middle of an uh, aphid colony, the egg hatches and then the larvae attaches itself to the leaf and then it will pound around like this. And it's got two mouth parts that look like egg hooks and they just rip the aphids apart and suck up the dirt. Gross, huh? <laughs> Better appreciation for aphids now. <laughs> yeah, aphids tend to be kind of the uh, meal for a large number of insects. So, And for identification, again, uh, this is what we use as entomologists. There's a vein. It's called a spurious vein. See where that uh, one cross vein comes down? And then there's a vein that intersects it. And it doesn't attach to the end of the, the, end of the wing or at the uh, base of the wing. So that's the spurious vein that we look for for a certain slide. And some of them actually are great mimics of bumblebees. So I, we've seen them around as well. So, so it behooves them to look like that again for protection. And this one you may have come into contact with. These are bee flies. And again, they like to land on people's arms and probe for, 
like you were talking about moisture and stuff like that. So that freaks people out as well. But you can see they're very, very long beak or proboscis that they use to suck up uh, nectar and um, water. And the other thing about them is uh, when they're at rest, their wings tend to be out away from their body. And they're uh, also parasites of grasshoppers, which is good. Most people like that, but they also attack some of our bee species too. So they're not as well loved when they do that. And then the tachinids, they're another type of fly that's a, a parasitoid parasite. You can see the fly has laid its eggs on the head of this caterpillar, and then the egg hatches, and then the larvae enters the body and feeds on the caterpillar while, it, while it's moving. In. And you can see this, and this is a different one, but you can see a parasitic looper where it stoned the looper and laid, laid its eggs inside of that. And remember when punk rock was real important and everybody had spike hair? If you look at the tachinids on the abdomen, they look like they have all these spike hairs. That's one way of distinguishing from, from the other flies. And there's a um, more of the flies, much more of the family of the colony. And these are some of them, the house flies, uh, blow flies, flesh flies, and the anthemites, thick-headed flies, soldier flies, and even mosquito, the males are pollinators. You know, a lot of people don't like to hear that either. But they actually do a pretty good job. So. And then there's the beetles, so the coleoptera. Coleo means sheath wing. And so the front wings are hardened and then the hind wings are used for flight. And there's over 300,000 species of beetles in the world. So they've been very, very successful. And the hardened front wings provide a protective sheath for the beetles so that they're very, very uh, safe from diseases and predators and also water loss. So they're, they're like I said, very, very successful. And then there's some of them are beautiful. So this happens to be a metallic wood boring beetle. Uh, they attack down and dead wood. Uh, the larvae is called the flat-headed wood borer because of that large area behind their head. Um, and they, like I said, feed on wood. And you'll find them on flowers because the adults will be looking for the pollen and nectar for food. These are cool because uh, Jean, my better half, her family had a, uh, a log cabin. And my first Christmas as an entomologist, one of these beetles came out of the house and was flying around in the kitchen. So I, I thought that was pretty exciting. Everybody else was, everybody else was kind of freaked out by the whole thing. But. These are the checkered flower beetles, and they tend to be hairy. But again, they're very, very important beetles because they're predators in the larval stage, and also some of the predators in the adult stage. But again, you'll find them on flowers picking up pollen and nectar again. And I call beetles trash and burn pollinators because they usually get out on you know, asters and they're going to trash around and they're going to destroy a lot of flowers, but they're going to pick up pollen in, the, in, the, in their efforts. So and they'll pass it from flower to flower. So. Well, they, that's the nice thing about asters because they have all the tube flowers. So they're not going to kill, kill all of them. They're going to get a few of them, then they're going to move on to the next flower. So, yeah, that would be a bad strategy. <laughs> <laughs> the next ones are the soft wing flower beetles. And again, they're important predators. They tend to be kind of this red and blue or checkered. And the cool thing about them is they, on their antennae, usually the second or third antennal segment, it's very, very large. One of them looks like a kernel of corn or like a big basketball on the, on the antennae. So. And then the longhorn beetles are very, very important. Uh, again, most of them in the larval stage are found in wood, but in the adult stage, again, they're moving around on their flowers looking for pollen and nectar. And, uh, and passing it from flower to flower. And they're called red-headed uh, round wood borers because they don't have that enlarged area. 
behind their head like the wood, uh, metallic wood boring thing would scoop. So, and, but you'll find them with stumps too. And our largest beetle happens to be in this family. It attacks stumps. It's a uh, prionis or ergates beetle, so a uh, giant pine sawyer beetle. And then the chrysomelids are the leaf beetles. Unfortunately, they're kind of a mixed bag as well in this sense, because a lot of them are pests. Like if you're trying to grow asparagus, you might have the asparagus leaf beetle as a problem and they feed on other plants. But again, as adults, they're, they're looking for pollen and nectar first because it's a, a quick food source. And then the last are the lepidopter, lep lepidopter, the butterfly, the moss. Lepto means scale wings. And so what's happened with the butterflies and moths is the hairs have been modified into these scales and they cover the membranous portion of the wing. And with that, I'll shut up. So I'll answer questions if you have any, or if you prefer to look at the collection, turn on the lights and look at the collection in the book. Books uh, that I have in the reference collection, or we can do both. I mean, you can ask the questions at both. So whatever works best for you. Yes. Like a draft. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of it has to do with species recognition, so that you can find the, the mate by that coloration. So. But not all of them use that strategy. So, you know, like butterflies and moths, butterflies are very colorful because they're out during the day you know, so they can find each other. But moths at night, you really don't want to be too colorful because you want to kind of blend in with the night. So, so they get to do more drag. Yes. The bark beetles that spread a lot of disease have um, any other Sure. <laughs> not really. <I'm> not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are a couple of because once they get into the tree, they're, yeah. they're, they're pretty safe. So, and with the change in climate and stuff that's going on, they're seeing bark beetle populations in Canada that they have not seen before. Um, if you're interested in what it's called, Empire of the Beetles, and it's about bark beetle populations in Alberta. Sorry. Okay. Now, I just read about water source. I think water culture. That's a good point. Yes, yeah, that's a good one. I forgot to mention that. So yeah, uh, normally they would pick up water, you know, in the in the environment. But if you have uh, like a small little man or something like that in a rock where they can land on, they can come down and get a drink and not drown themselves. Because you well, you probably don't know this, but you collect these, they're called bee bowls. And so you put water in there, so it comes against the water, and the, the surface tension is no longer there, and the deep ground in the water. Yeah, it stinks. So you need a rock in there to <laughs> protect them from ground. So, yeah. And we have many ways of killing insects. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So with the mason bee, one of the concerns is we well, need habitat. So that's important. I mean, putting just putting the net, uh, you know, the tubes out, probably you're not going to attract very many of them. And then they recommend to, uh, once they emerge, to actually clean out the the tubes and stuff like that. So like if you want to do this, they'll actually sell you sell a, a cardboard tube, and then you can sort of uh, uh, yeah, paper tube inside of that. And then once the, the bee emerges, then you can pop that out and put a new one in there before they start a uh, new colony. So that, that helps them out a lot. So they do talk about um, cleaning. It's very, very important. The, over a two or three year period, you're going to get diseases associated with that. You're not going to have a very successful habitat for these or these kind of bees. So does that answer? Yeah, uh, we talked about the different like, some swaps and the same elements. You know, is there a species that is to the female sting? Yeah, 
That's very true. Yeah, the bills because the Stinger is a modified cabling device or old monitor, bills are never had. So that there's no way they can stick. They can look like they want to do that, but a lot of uh, entomologists they'll recognize that a bumblebee is a male and they'll be petting it and doing all of this kind of stuff and freaking people out, but they know that it's a male and they're not going to be stung. So, yeah, so that's very true. Yes. They're gentle giants. Yeah, they, I think they figure, you know, if you're really going to mess with them, you're going to get stuck. But mostly people avoid them and they, animals avoid them. So they, they are not aggressive. No. I've never found them to be aggressive. Other than I did when I was in high school, I had one of them fly my football helmet and shoot me in the face. But that's the only time. Oh, yes. I was wondering if you know, so you mentioned earlier about the economic issues of publishers and how many of these out there and how many of these are out there. Is there any information in one of the reports that allows me to see the insurance that makes it available? I'm familiar with some other work where. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I don't know of any information specific to Washington, but when you look at Michigan and Florida and other states, they do have some data like that. And also in Europe, I've got, got the opportunity to work with Maxine, he's a postdoc from Belgium, and he's doing all this work in Europe with my cherries. Trying to sort out the economic advantages of giving each other volunteers and sites and so 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 yeah, there's information out there. I just don't know that it's here in Washington. Yes. I think it's important to mention that um, Washington also now has all my passports and that everything we have by legislature and it's now it's in case so obviously we'll be able to have this board practice. <coughs> Thanks for mentioning that. That's very important, yes. And there's also the Washington Native Bee Association. So WADM, so no, the A, excuse me, where the end come from? Yes. Size, but they're not as big as a giant agent hornet. But people get nervous about it because they see something like the cicada killer, which is what our largest solitary wasp, close to a size, but really not and not the right coloration and stuff. But they don't, don't want to kill those. Or I had a person bring in a, a elm sawfly 
the, and it's large too, but you know, it's, remember we talked about broad, broadly attached abdomen and they have club antennae and things like that. So they, they, they don't look like a giant Asian hornet, but to a person that doesn't know insects, that's, that, that's problematic. So, so that's, a, so if you guys have that, and I know you'll probably get questions about it, that's a good site to do that. And I think they're doing, and to answer your question, I think they're doing the best they can, but I don't know how, uh, how easy it's going to be to track these, uh, and find the nest. That's going to be the hard part. But they do have traps out there. Has anybody else been working with, like uh, WWS or Washington State Department Bank, or any had work with them? Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I've got some information here, and I also brought I got a giant Asian hornet in plastic, so you can get an idea of what size they are. <laughs> Thank you. Just keep doing what you're doing. This is great. 